Okay, let me continue or let me finish. My first question, um, during the break, I have got a good, good question actually. In the beginning of this lecture, I showed you that in order to find best response curve in Bitran game with differentiated products, we can use either twice strip rule or we can use first de derivative of profit and get the same. Do you understand why? Do you understand why it is just the same? And actually, where the twice steep rule comes from? Mm -hmm. I will show you a very simple example. Um, our famous demand function, and even if we assume that we have a monopoly, now it's only one firm, mm -hmm. say marginal costs are equal to 10. In order to find um, the profit maximizing quantity, I can apply twice a steep rule, right? Marginal revenue will be equal to 100 minus 2q, then I equal, equate it to 10, and they get q equal to 45, right? Um, on the other hand, I can do the following. Say, what is my profit? Okay, if I want to find, look, I want to find profit maximizing quantity. Why not to start with profit, if I want to maximize the profit? Profit is P minus marginal costs multiplied by Q, right? P is my demand. 100 minus, uh, minus Q minus marginal costs equal to 10 multiplied by Q. Mm -hmm. 90 Q minus uh, Q square. Now I, I find first derivative of, of uh, profit with respect to Q. This will be 90 minus 2Q. In order to find the maximum of this function, I equate it to 0, right? And Q is equal to 45. Some similarity. Why so? And why, okay, I would say that this is the right way. Say, this is the logical way. If I want to maximize profit, I start with the profit. In the handbook, they just wanted to simplify the life for students who don't like derivatives. That's why they offered you this twice steep rule, mostly like a rule of thumb. Look where it comes from. Say, if instead of profit, maximizing profit from the beginning, I say, what is my total revenue? Hmm? Total revenue is what I get without considering any costs. This is price multiplied by Q. Mm -hmm. So this will be 100 minus Q and multiplied by Q. Mm -hmm. 100 Q minus Q square. What is marginal revenue? Mm -hmm. This is the first derivative of total revenue. Mm -hmm. This is the speed with which uh, the function changes. So marginal revenue is total revenue first derivative, right? If I t uh, find first derivative of this thing, it will be 100 minus 2q. This is your twice steep rule. rule. Look now. Mm -hmm. But now, when I want to use this profit maximization, what I do actually, I do just the same, but I put my marginal cost immediately into the function, instead of equating that only now, on the last step. So here in one equation, I put all my data together and immediately arrive to the outcome. Here, I have to like make several steps. That's it. But OK, um, in this way, you see that um, this works for monopolistic markets. So it will work for anything else. You can find reaction functions in Cournot game, in Bertrand game. It doesn't matter. This way will always work, because this is just the same. Mm -hmm. Okay, regarding exam from 2009, I think it's rather straightforward. Mm -hmm. There is nothing like Cournot game with differentiated products and so on. I don't think there should be any problems with that. Mm -hmm. That's why I will use a bit more time on the handbook. With you, I want to go to the chapter 11,
problem five and six. This is the limit pricing story. Hmm? We have a monopolist with the following demand curve. Five, eleven point five. We have a monopolist that faces this demand curve minus two Q, and his marginal costs are equal to thirty. Solve the profit maximizing level of mono mono monopoly output price and profits. So. Either twice a steep rule or profit maximization whatsoever, yeah, <laughs> will give you just the same. So, um, say 3.9 minus 4q equal to 30. So, from here, you get q equal to 90. Mm -hmm. And then the price will be 300, 390 minus uh, 180, and you get 210. And then price, or profit, will be 16,200. 16, mm -hmm. This is A. Then B. Suppose a potential entrant is considering entering, but the monopolist has a cost advantage. The potential entrant, entrant faces costs equal to 40. So marginal cost of potential entrant is equal to 40. Assuming the monopolist continues to profit maximize, solve for the residual demand curve for the entrant. Well, what will we do to find this residual demand curve? Minus the quantity of the monopolist situation. Right, because what is this? This is 390 minus 2q of monopolist and minus 2q of this potential entrant. Mm -hmm. And if we assume that monopolist continues to profit maximize, then this is known, right? Mm -hmm. This is 90. Mm -hmm. So this uh, residual demand uh, curve would be um, 210 minus 2q potential entrant, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. Then assume the potential entrant follows the Cournot assumption about the monopolist's output. What is Cournot assumption about monopolist's output? Um, it is one of the most really weird assumption of the model itself, but it is called like that. This is the assumption that the entrant, uh, the monopolist, keeps the output level uh, the same when the entering occurs, right? Mm -hmm. um, solve for the potential entrance output, price and profits in this scenario. What are the new monopoly profits? Um, well, now we have this potential entrant residual demand cur curve and we can apply this twice this strip rule, profit maximization, whatsoever, we get 210 minus 4q equal to 40. From here, here q is equal to 42.5. I find price 125 and I find profit of potential entrant if he enters as 3612.5, right? Um, and according to this model, what happens? Look, here the price of monopolist before the enter occurred was 210. Then someone enters the market and he can offer the same product uh, with this new price. Mm -hmm. Therefore, my uh, monopolist has to respond to this price decrease. But we have this Cournot assumption that he maintains 
the same output level. Mm -hmm. So it means that now I find new monopoly profit with the same output, but with the new price. Mm -hmm. So it will be 90 to 125 minus cost, minus 30. And this is equal to 8550. Mm -hmm. um, but D, is there a price the monopolist could charge to deter entry? Solve for the limit price and output that will completely deter entry. What is monopoly profit at this point? So we can guess. Mm -hmm. What is the limit pricing there? What is the price that limits the enter? Okay, not exactly. It's 40 minus epsilon, right? Because it's just 40. Uh, the potential entrant, he earns zero profit, but still he may have an incentive to enter if he just like, you know, it may happen still. So therefore we say that my limit pricing is 40 minus epsilon. Mm -hmm. Um, what will be Q in this case? Say if this is 40 minus epsilon is equal to 3, 9 minus 2 Q. Mm -hmm. In this case, I get Q equal to 175, say, plus some epsilon. It should be something a little bit larger, right? Um, the profit of monopolist in this case will be, say, this 40 minus 30 minus epsilon to 175. If you want, again, you can write this epsilon, some marginal stuff. And then we got some, something like this. Mm -hmm. So actually, it's almost equal to this number. Um, and then part C, oh, uh, problem 6. Consider the problem described in problem 5. A, make an extensive form of the game based on your solutions in problem five, right? <coughs> extensive form game, what is this? Mm, another extensive form, form game. Three game three. Game three. Mm -hmm. Normal form game is something uh, that is represented by a table. Mm -hmm. You have like table two by two, three by three. This is normal form game. If you have a tree, it means that we incorporate some notion of sequence into the game. Mm -hmm. And this is called extensive form game. Say 11.6. What will be my game tree? Potential entrant thinks what to do, either to enter the market or to stay out, right? Say we here say stay out. Here we have enter the market. Then I have a monopolist who has to decide. He has two decision nodes, right? One is profit maximization, still, like just to do as before, or to, pr to limit prices. And just the same here, profit maximization or limit pricing. And we have said that we want to build this tree based on everything that we solved before. I think it's a little bit confusing, especially in light of the fact that they provided a criticism of this model by game theorists. Mm -hmm. And these game theorists, they offered a little bit different solution. Mm -hmm. They said that, okay, well, if the entrant enters, they both maximize profits and they share the market. Mm -hmm. But we should not be actually confused here because it's explicitly said in the problem formulation, mm -hmm. based on your solutions in problem five. So we don't have to invent anything else. Just use everything that we have here. Say, so what if the guy stays out and monopolist continues to profit maximize? Then we're here, right? Um, potential entrant, he has zero. This has 16,200, right? What if the guy stays out? And monopolist uh, limits prices. Hmm? Well, still, but we have to write the outcome. Um, it will be zero, and here we have this thing, right? 
one seven five minus this epsilon. Um, what if the entrant decides to enter? The monopolist still continues to profit maximize. Um, then we have this, this, right? Mm -hmm. Three, six, one, two point five. Another one, eight, five, five. Mm -hmm. In case of enter and limit pricing, the same. Then we are asked to solve uh, for the Nash equilibrium of the game. How do we start? Backward. Backward induction. First, we consider, we just forget about this part of the game, and look here. Monopolist looks at his second uh, outcome, uh, second number. So he chooses this, right? Now we consider a second subgame. Uh, the monopolist decides between these two. He is better off here. So we see that this is sort of a dominant strategy, always to profit maximize, right? Now, potential entrant, um, he looks between these two. He is better off here. Right? And this is my equilibrium path. How should we reason or analyze the game? What happens? See. Now, uh, potential entrant will look only into these two options? Um, yeah, you remember, we discussed that. Say, when I solve this subgame, <coughs> And I find that, well, this is the equilibrium outcome of this small game. Now, instead of this decision node, I can have an outcome node. So I just put my outcome here and forget about everything else. Because this is the game that actually the potential entrant faces. And same here. We can forget about this. Now we solve this game. He looks at his outcome, this is first number, and he's better off here. So this is the only thing that can happen. Um, okay, I raised, but uh, in fact, what was the logic of the game? In a way, the monopolist, he threatened the potential entrant, saying that, well, see, if you enter the market, I will beat you. Mm -hmm. I mean, I will um, reduce the price such that you have a loss. Mm -hmm. Therefore, think twice before you enter. But when uh, the potential entrant draws his own decision tree, he understands that this threat is not credible. That monopolist will never do that. Just because he's, o he's still better off by having uh, this profit instead of this 750. Mm -hmm. Therefore, the, uh, the only Nash equilibrium or subgame perfect equilibrium of this game would be to uh, potential entrant to enter and uh, the monopolist to share the market. Right? Mm -hmm. Yeah? Uh, in case when the potential entrant say so, what's the need of the monopolist to limit the price? No need at all. But this is the structure of the game. So why are we then You know, um, here it's quite weird representation in a way. We can change the things other way around. Say that monopolist stays first, yeah, like his decision order is first, and then potential entrant moves second. It only means um, what is the sequence of decisions? Either I can monopolist can limit prices before they enter or after the entry occurs. And probably in this case it would be better to change the places, yeah. To say that monopolist decides first either to uh, limit prices or not, and then the potential enter decides whether to enter or not. Mm -hmm. So then um, the game will look like that. That is monopolist decides profit maximization or limit pricing, and then the potential entrant decides, right? Probably it would be even better. Mm? Actually, even lo more logical. 
I just used the same um, logic how it is described in the book. Mm -hmm. They, for some reasons, thought that this guy should move first. Mm -hmm. Right? Again, okay, one more exercise that I want to go through with you. This is chapter 13 about product, differ product differentiation. No, yeah, right. So this is chapter 13, problem number 6. In a monopolistically competitive industry, total profits, y, and the function of the number of firms, n, is the follow, goes as follows. So profit in the industry depends on number of firms in the industry and it is equal to 10 minus 1 minus 10 to n. This is the function. Furthermore, consumer surplus is a function of n where consumer surplus is equal to n um, consumer surplus as the function of n is equal to square root of n. Mm -hmm. In long run equilibrium, how many firms will exist in the industry? So how many? Remember, that was a model. Um, chapter 13.4, I guess. Huh? Um, welfare implications. Yeah, and we had some graph, yeah, that it looks like something like that, and so on and so forth, the profit, consumer surplus. Mm -hmm. The main outcome of this um, model was that companies enter the market until there is still any positive profit that can be earned, right? So I will have what will be the equilibrium number of firms. It will be 10 minus 1 over 10, n, and it should be equal to 0. Mm -hmm. So companies will enter until there is still a possibility to earn at least anything, at least something, right? So from here, I get n equilibrium equal to 100. Mm -hmm. But d, in long run equilibrium, uh, what is the sum of profit plus consumer surplus? So if we have n companies on the market, profit is equal to zero, right? Consumer surplus is square root of n. It is, it is 10, right? Mm -hmm. And total welfare is uh, the sum of consumer surplus and profit. Mm -hmm. In this case, it is 10, because this is 0 in equilibrium, right? Or say, this is welfare from 100 firms on the market. Mm -hmm. Then there is a question. Is this the socially optimal level, level of product differentiation? Uh, there is given a hint. What happens to the value of welfare for values of n slightly smaller or slightly larger than the value of n that answers part A? Um, what they suggest us to do is to see, okay, what if n is equal to uh, 101 to calculate the value? What will happen if n is equal to 99? But we are very smart with you. Yeah. Uh, we want not only to check whether it is socially optimal, we want to find what is optimal, right? 
how we do this? Um, social welfare is the sum, and we want to maximize this sum. It is equal to 10 minus 1 over 10n plus square root of n, and this should be maximized. Right? How do you max maximize the function? The derivative equals to zero. Right. You find the first derivative of this stuff. And what is this? Minus 1 of 10 n plus 1 half 1 over n. Right? Hmm? Mm -hmm. And this is equal to 0. Um, no, this should be not n, like that. Then 100, or 1 over the square root of n is equal to 1 over 5, right? Then n from here is equal to 25. Mm -hmm. Make sense? In this case, the profit will be equal to 10 minus tw uh, 25 over 10 is equal to 7.5 mm -hmm. and consumer surplus will be equal to to 5 mm -hmm. then in this case welfare will be 12.5 mm -hmm. so this is the implication of the model you remember that was a result that probably because of the fact that companies do not look at welfare as such they look only their profit they may be too much variety on the market, m more than is socially optimal. This is exactly this case. As long as companies, they enter the market until the point where profit is equal to zero, this is the equilibrium number of companies. Mm -hmm. This is what the companies will want to do. Uh, but this happens if we don't look at this part at all. Mm -hmm. But if we are public policy makers, for example, and we want to maximize not the profit in the industry, but to maximize social welfare, we maximize instead of this function, we maximize this bigger fun function. Mm -hmm. And in this case, it turns out that equilibrium number of companies is too large. In order to maximize social welfare, it should be reduced four times. Mm -hmm. If we reduce amount of variety on the market, uh, number of firms, we increase social welfare. No, no we increase tot uh, total welfare. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Instead of 10, now we get 12.5. Mm -hmm. This is sort of an um, example how to use the model um, in chapter 13.4, welfare implications of product variety. Mm -hmm. um, that's it probably from my side for today. Only couple of general advices left. First of all, don't be scared uh, with anything in your exam. You're very smart. You have gone through many, many different things. It cannot be anything above what we have gone through. Mm -hmm. uh, so don't be nervous. Whatever happens, remember that marginal revenue is equal to marginal cost. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, and it should be OK. And we have 15 minutes for your questions, whatever mm -hmm. you can ask. Yeah, by the way, I have a question. Uh, what is the rule for exam? Yes, you don't know. Oh, OK, it's not only me. The rule for exam, where the exam will take place. <laughs> Good question. OK, then I probably should fix it. Yeah, right? Mm -hmm. Um, just for the case, I think I will come to your exam like one hour after the beginning. Mm -hmm. yeah? If there are some uh, misunderstandings or if the problem formulation is still not okay, <coughs> <laughs> I will be there. Right, okay, now your questions. Mm -hmm. Okay, can you tell us something about the form of the exam for the uh, large Yes. Pretty much the same. A bit different distribution. 75 uh, to 25. Mm -hmm. Yeah? What's the difference between 
welfare is always a sum of consumer surplus and producer surplus. Um, in a way, it should not be a difference in the exercise that, that you do. Look, um, that was a case uh, with competitive market, right? And then we saw that what if this is the price, competitive price? Mm -hmm. If this is my supply curve and this is demand curve, this supply curve that is derived in chapter 3 or chapter 2, in a way, this is marginal cost curve on the market. Yeah? This is something that is left from here. You just make an approximation that this is linear. Usually it is not. Then we say that this thing, all of that, is consumer surplus, right? Everything that lies here is producer surplus. Mm -hmm. But now think, this was competitive market. In problems that we usually solve, our market structure looks differently. We have this demand function, but costs goes like that. Mm -hmm. Right? And then we say that, first of all, if we have competitive market, profit is equal to zero or something like that. But this is, in a way, um, the graph for the whole market, right? This is the graph for one firm. Mm -hmm. Here we can calculate this consumer surplus, but producer surplus is not here, in a way. Yeah? Not the producer surplus in the whole market. When we talk about one company, we have only its profit. But anyway, this is actually all profits of all companies on the market. You see? So therefore, in your exercises, it doesn't make any difference what you actually consider. Either this is a profit or producer surplus. Say, producer surplus, in a way, this is the summation of all profits in the market. Mm -hmm. So here you have different companies, and you say that there are, for example, some producer here, producer, say, one, who can offer this product for this small price, right? Then there are some more producers. He can offer this product for this price. And all of this difference will always be his profit. This is what he earns, right? And then when we summarize all of these profits, we get producer surplus. In our exercises, usually, we have only one or two firms. If we sum up their profits, we actually will get this producer surplus on market. Mm -hmm. Make sense? So don't be confused in that. It's just the same. Something else? <laughs>